Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. It is now the time for the story of the Arlington Street Church Mitten Tree, and this year's version of the story was written by our own Carol Fisher. Once there was a woman named Sarah who lived on Appleton Street at the, in the south end of Boston. Sarah loved to knit. She used to walk down Boyle Street, Boylston Street every day, not just for exercise, but to leave some of the mittens, hats, and scarves she had knit on the railing of the Arlington Street MBTA station for those who might need them. Another thing that Sarah did was volunteer with the Friday night supper program at Arlington Street Church. Every Friday night, a group of volunteers cooked and served supper to the homeless. The volunteers, as well as all of the guests, enjoyed their time together every Friday night. One afternoon on her way to the church, Sarah saw a young man named Joe waiting for the doors to open so he could go in for supper. She noticed that he had a mitten on one hand and his other hand was in his pocket. The other men waiting for supper were tossing snowballs and playing in the alley, and Sarah wondered why Joe wasn't playing with them. But it was time for supper, so Sarah went to the kitchen. And as everyone came in, things were very busy, but Sarah noticed that Joe only had one mitten. And that's why he wasn't playing with the other men. Sarah, Sarah worried about Joe all week. That Wednesday night, she looked through all of her yarn, and she found some that she could use to make a special pair of mittens. She worked on the mittens Wednesday and Thursday night while she watched movies on TV, and by Friday morning, they were done. On her way to church that Friday afternoon to volunteer, Sarah hung the mittens on the stair rail to the parish hall on the alley side of the church. Joe was the first one to arrive, and when he saw the mittens, he knew they were for him, and he was so excited and grateful. Sarah decided to knit a scarf for another man who didn't have a scarf and a hat for another. She noticed that there were quite a few people who could use more to keep them warm that winter. Sarah also remembered that members of the Arlington Street Church decorated a Christmas tree with mittens, gloves, scarves, and hats every year and gave those donations to a local orphanage. She began to think that the clothing collected could be better used right at Arlington Street Church for the men who came to supper on Friday nights. She talked with Rachel, the director of the Friday Night Supper program, and Reverend Kim. Reverend Kim and Rachel were really excited about Sarah's idea. They decided that that, that year, all of the hats and gloves and scarves that were collected on the tree would go to the Friday Night Supper program. They would be put in goodie bags and given out at a special dinner. The week before the goodie bags were given out, Rachel announced to those who came to the supper that there would be a surprise the next week. And when they came, there was a surprise. The men were so delighted with their goodie bags, filled with warm things to wear. And a new tradition was born at Arlington Street Church. And everyone who brought and gave mittens felt the warmth of that tradition. Sarah continues to knit mittens and hats and scarves to contribute to the Arlington Street Church mitten tree. Others who maybe are not as skilled at knitting, buy things at the stores to bring in to decorate the tree. It doesn't matter how the things get to the tree. What matters is the tree is full, and we can continue to help the homeless keep warm this Christmas season. And now is the time to decorate our tree, so I invite all those who brought warm items to come forward as you're able, and we will fill the tree.
American Tibetan Buddhist nun, Pema Chidron, commends to us an ancient teaching with a fabulous new name, on the spot practice. The practice of being fully present, feeling your heart and greeting the next moment with an open mind. You can be on the spot at any time. When you wake up in the morning, before a difficult conversation, whenever fear or discomfort arises. When I was serving our congregation in Provincetown, the tradition began of trying to extend the tourist season into early October with special themed weekends. Somehow our very first attempt combined women's weekend, leather weekend, and Fantasia Fair meaning that our little fishing village and artist colony was suddenly exuberantly brimming with a gender-bending celebration of lesbians, gay men, and cross-dressers. It was fabulous. Church that Sunday was amazing. I had noticed, seated in the midst of a sea of scantily leather-clad men and extremely tall women, a very blonde, very wholesome-looking family. The children, seated between their mother and father, were beautifully dressed and clearly used to being in church. I felt a ping of joy at our diversity. After the service, the father approached me and asked if we might speak for a moment. He was visibly upset. My heart sank. I was so happy, and he was not. I led him into my study and shut the door. Reverend, he began. I braced myself. I have reason to believe that there was a homosexual in your church this morning. So I'm just going to let you imagine some of the responses that went through my mind. Despite years of practicing on the spot, it was all I could do to keep from blurting out something defensive or offensive. Maybe it was the fruit of spiritual practice, or maybe it was grace. Something, something stopped me from opening my mouth. And he continued, I'm afraid you're looking at him. As his coming out poured forth in a flood of anguish, I had just enough spaciousness to realize how differently this conversation might have gone had I stopped him before he was able to finish. If I'd shut down or shot down, rather than taking that one deep breath into my heart and stayed open. I have never almost made that mistake again. An on-the-spot practice, writes Pema Chidron, is to walk down the street with the intention of staying as awake as possible to whomever we meet. This is training in being emotionally honest with ourselves and becoming more available to others. We notice if we feel attraction, aversion, or indifference without adding anything extra, like self-judgment. We might feel compassion towards someone who looks depressed or cheered up by someone who's smiling to themselves. We might feel fear and aversion for another person without even knowing why. As we pass people, we simply notice whether we open up or shut down. We can practice this way for even one block of a city street. Notice where we open up and where we shut down without praise or blame, and see what happens. Pema Trudin continues, this is a beautiful way to claim your spiritual warriorship. In other words, it's a way to claim your kindness, your strength. Whatever occurs to you, you can pause briefly, touch in with how you're feeling, both physically and mentally, and then just connect with your heart even putting your hand on your heart if you want to. This is a way of extending warmth and acceptance to whatever is going on for you right now. Whatever it is, 
you can let it just be there, just as it is, without labeling it good or bad, without telling yourself you should or shouldn't be feeling that way. Having connected with what is, your love, you, can go forward with curiosity and courage. Auburn Sandstrom tells this on the spot story. The year is 1992, Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm curled up in a fetal position on a filthy carpet in a very cluttered apartment in a horrible withdrawal from a drug I've been addicted to for several years now. In my hand, I have a little piece of paper. I've been folding it and unfolding it to the point that it's almost falling apart. I am in a state of bald terror, and I've never been in a darker or more desperate place. My husband is out running the streets trying to get a hold of some of the stuff we need, but I know if he succeeds, he is not going to share. And if I could, I would jump out of my own skin and run screaming into the streets to get what I need. But right behind me, sleeping in our bedroom, is my baby boy. I had started out fairly auspiciously, she continues. I was raised in comfort and privilege. I had a master's degree. But I started noticing things like poverty and racism and unconscionable injustice and that people like me were mostly causing it. It was a huge revelation for me. I came to the conclusion that the thing I needed to do with all the comfort I'd had in my life was to destroy it. And you know, every time I've come to a major faulty conclusion in life, the man comes right after who will help me live it out. And this was no different. Man, was he beautiful. A radical revolutionary, a poet from Detroit. I was 24, he was 40. I was smitten in love with how he talked, how he looked at the world, and it was so beautiful for a while until he introduced me to one of his old activist friends who introduced us to the drug we were now addicted to. I had tried to transform myself, she says. I had wanted to shed my class. I would have shed my race if I could. But instead of transformation, I was living a life that was going to lead me to losing the most precious thing I'd ever had, which was that baby boy. I was emaciated covered in bruises, so anxious, in such a desperate state, that I became willing to punch the numbers into the phone. The phone number was something my mother had sent me, not that I had been speaking to my parents for three, four, five years, but she'd managed to get this number to me by mail, and she said, this is a Christian counselor. Maybe sometime you could call this person. I punched in the numbers. I heard the phone pick up. A man said, hello. And I said, hi, I got this number from my mother. Uh, do you think you could maybe talk to me? And I heard him shuffling around in the bed. You could tell he was pulling up some sheets around himself and sitting up. And I heard a little radio in the background. He snapped it off, and he became very present. He said, yes, yes. Yes, what's going on? I hadn't told anybody the truth, including myself, for a long, long time. And I told him I wasn't feeling so good and that I was scared. And before long, I was telling him other truths, like I might have a drug problem. And I really, really love my husband, and I wouldn't want you to say anything bad about him, but he has hit me a few times. I started telling these truths. And this man didn't judge me. He just sat with me and listened. And he had such a kindness and such a gentleness. Tell me more. That must have hurt. Oh. I'd made that call at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he stayed up with me the whole night, just talking, just listening just being there until the sun rose. And by then I was feeling calm. The raw panic had passed. I was feeling like 
I can splash my face with water and I can probably do this day. I was very grateful to him. I said, hey, you know, I really appreciate you and what you've done for me tonight. Aren't you like supposed to be getting me to read some Bible verses or something? And he laughed and said, well, I'm, I'm really glad this was helpful to you. And I said, no, really, you are very, very good at this. I mean, you've seriously done a very big thing for me. How long have you been a Christian counselor? And there's a long pause, and I hear him shifting. Auburn, please don't hang up, he says. I've been trying not to bring this up. What, I ask, you won't hang up? No. I'm so afraid to tell you this. The number you called, he pauses again. You got the wrong number. I'm not a Christian counselor. I'm not even Christian or a counselor. And I felt this kind of joy, says Auburn Sandstrom, like I was shining. I had gotten to see that there was this completely random love in the universe, that it could be unconditional, and that some of it was for me. I can't tell you that I got my life totally together all at once, but it became possible to get some help and to get out. And it also became possible to be a teetotaling, semi-sane, single parent and to raise up that precious baby boy into a magnificent scholar and athlete who graduated from Princeton University with honors. This is what I know, she says, in the longest, deepest, darkest night of despair. If you can just get one pinhole of light, all of grace rushes in. Beloved spiritual companions, let's practice being on the spot. Let's embrace our acceptance and our love and live that. May we seek to be sources of light through which all of grace rushes in. Amen. Once you stood below a mountain, now you find yourself surprised. This is the sweet spot of your life, cause this new view compares to nothing, gone are the hardship of your climb. This is the sweet spot of your life And it would seem the ice is melting It seems you've come in from the cold This is the sweet spot of your life And all your streams, they are now fuller Than what their river banks can hold this is the sweet spot of your life. So you must hold these days like treasures in a jewel box in your heart. This is the sweet spot of your life. For you know well they are most precious into an old tree must carve them. This is the sweet spot of your life. May it only sting a moment when you dive into that blue. This 
sees the sweet spot of your life. Cause by the time you reach the surface, it has rearranged you. This is the sweet spot of your life. You always wanted something solid, just one solid thing. Oh, but angels are so fickle, they only love you when you sing. But you don't need those fickle angels to shine. This is the sweet spot of your Once you stood below a mountain, now you find yourself surprised. This is the sweet spot of your life. Cause this new view compares to nothing, gone the hardship of your climb. This is the sweet spot of your life. Dive into that blue. This is the sweet spot of your life. Cause by the time you hit the surface, it has rearranged you. This is the sweet spot. This is the sweet spot, this is the sweet spot of your life, this is the sweet spot, this is the sweet spot, this is the sweet spot of your life. And let's join hands for the benediction. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we deeply experience that we are not isolated beings but connected in mystery and miracle to one another and to every living being. Keep the faith, beloveds, and give it away. This service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. Amen.
please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.